What do we think about when we think about Christmas? The question could go in a couple of different ways, couldn't it? We could lean into the maybe the cultural, secular side of it, right? Christmas and shopping and gifts and Santa Claus and elves and parties and gatherings at the office and all these kinds of things. Or maybe we could lean in to the religious side of it. Candles and special services and carols and nativities and children dressing up like shepherds and wise men, all these things we think about Christmas, those are the images that come to mind, aren't they? Things like that. There's one word that almost never comes to mind when we talk about Christmas. We talk about it a lot the rest of the year, but for some reason when we slide into December and head towards Christmas Eve, this word sometimes fades into the background or sits to the side until January, and then we'll get, we'll get back to it. When you think about it, it's surprising that we don't talk so much about this one word when it's Christmas time, because it's really what Christmas is all about, the meaning, the message, reason, the season, and all that. This one word encapsulates everything that the nativity embodies and signifies. The word is mission. Think about it. The incarnation, the arrival of Jesus, sent from the Father to us, is the first mission trip, isn't it? It is the mission of God. The the theologians call it the missio dei, if you're into Latin. The rest of us can just call it the mission of God, okay? But this is a thing. This is the God who shows up. This is the God who sends his son. This is the God who comes to us. Why? For us and for our salvation, as the creeds tell us. This is the God who is present. And the entire thing hinges on the arrival of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, the incarnation, the nativity. It's the first mission, and it's the mission of God. But we tend to isolate Christmas from mission sometimes. Not on purpose, I don't think. It just sort of happens that way. December rolls around, and we know the text we go to. And we know the text the preacher's going to preach from. We go to Matthew 1, we go to Luke 2, maybe some other ones kind of in that vicinity. But that's where we go, and we know that. Sometimes we'll we'll link those texts up with maybe an Isaiah 7, because Matthew pushes us in that direction. But generally, we tend to just kind of lean into the standard text in December. And maybe we take the arrival of Jesus in isolation from other other aspects of our faith. What would happen if we integrate those things? What would happen if we recognize that Old and New Testament hinge on the arrival of Jesus? God showing up in a human body, not for sentimentality, not for kicks, but because at his heart is a mission to the lost, namely us, who start out far from him and are only drawn near because he is gracious. So what happens if we recognize that the heart of Christmas, the message of Christmas, is the mission of God? Does it change the way we order our lives this time of year? Does it reshape the way we think about how we engage with our neighbors? And the nations? What's the impact? 
the principle arises in Joseph's story. Luke gives us a little more detail about Mary's experience of this whole thing. Matthew tells us more about Joseph's experience. Chapter 1, verse 18, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place like this. Mary and Joseph were engaged, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child. Joseph was surprised, as we would expect him to be. And we're told he's a righteous man. So we're invited to think about what an unrighteous man or how an unrighteous person might have responded. Public shame, anger, throw you out, cast you out, public spectacle. Sometimes we want people to know how angry we are when we've been wronged. Matthew tells us Joseph doesn't come at the situation like that. Being a righteous man, he decides to just end the relationship quietly. You go your way, I'll go mine. No reason to have a spectacle, no reason to make the shame and the publicity all the worse. And that would have been that if God, through an angelic messenger, had not intervened. And so he did. Just, we are told, just when Joseph had resolved to dismiss Mary quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said this, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Notice the way the messenger of God zeroes in on Joseph's emotional experience. What will my friends say about me if I don't end this? What will the community think about me if I take her as my wife? Imagine the sense of fear that he experienced. Frustration. What will they call me? What will they say to my face? And worse, what will they say behind my back? So the angel says, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. Yes, your life has been disrupted. Yes, things are not going according to your plan. <laughs> but that doesn't mean there is no plan. And you have an opportunity to be a part of it. So don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Why? Because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Here's what's going to happen, Joseph. She's going to bear a son, and here's what you're supposed to do. You give him a name. You name him Jesus. And here's the reason. And this is where we begin to see the mission of God unfold in the pages of Scripture in the person of Jesus. You name him Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. You name him Jesus. And his name will signify his missional objective. Anyone who has a proper mission knows a proper mission comes with a proper objective. And here in the gospel narrative, in the account of the nativity, chapter one in the New Testament, this is the reason he came. It was a rescue mission. Someone needs to be saved. Lots of someones need to be saved. We need him to save us. The incarnation is a rescue mission. The God who called the world into existence, who speaks and things that weren't all of a sudden are, the God who forms human beings in his image from dust. The God who breathes the breath of life. The 
God who called Abraham and promised him a son in his old age. The God who rescued the Hebrew people from the land of Egypt and the slavery they experienced there. That God is present in this baby because he desires and intends to rescue his rebel sons and daughters. And so we are told, Joseph is told, here's the project. Jesus didn't come so that we could have a festive December. That's nice. Jesus didn't come so we could go to the store and buy cute little scenes of cows and shepherds and put them on our coffee tables. <laughs> Those are nice. Jesus came to save rebels. And he did it to bring God near to us. You shall name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew then adds a little commentary. This took place to fulfill what the prophet said. Isaiah, and it's seven, Isaiah 7, 14, if you're interested. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Again, there's the mission. This is a God who doesn't sit back and wait to see what happens. This is a God who doesn't sit idly by and consider the options. This is a God who sees what needs to be done. So there's a rescue mission that needs to happen. And this God doesn't send someone else. He goes himself. He doesn't say it'll take care of itself. He knows it won't. He shows up. He signs up. He goes. And he goes knowing he will suffer and bleed and die. This is the mission of God. This is a God who is present with those he has come to save. We learn some things about this God in this narrative, don't we? We begin to learn some things about his character. We learn some things about the way he views sinners, don't we? One of the things we discover about him is his patience. Scripture elsewhere testifies about the patience of God. Paul mentions how God has looked, passed over sins committed before time in Romans 3 so that now Jesus can come and rescue. Peter says, if you're wondering why the return of Jesus is delayed, it's because he's patient and he wants more people to come. The arrival of Jesus, the mission of God, reveals this aspect of God's character. He's patient with sinners. Adam sinned. There are consequences, but God is patient. The Hebrew people sinned again and again, idolatry and all kinds of things, and God bears with them and keeps coming back. Century after century after century, he is patient until the day he shows up in Jesus. And now he's patient with us, isn't he? 
And this is important because it begins to clear up some misunderstandings. Throughout my time in ministry as a pastor, I regularly run up on folks who don't see God as being a patient God. Kind of walk around on eggshells, assuming that God is just waiting for them to mess up so that he can smack them around or lightning bolts from heaven or something. And so they live this life and feel like I've got to do what I'm supposed to do so God will like me. I've got to, I've got to not sin so that God won't get mad at me and make bad things happen to me. It, it may sound crazy, friends, but I guarantee you We walk alongside brothers and sisters who experience, not experience, who perceive God that way. And if there's one thing we see on the pages of Scripture again and again, and if there's one thing that emerges here when he shows up, it's that God's response to our sin is not primarily to knock us around. Yes, Adam had to go out of the garden. There are reasons for that. But this God is patient. He says, this Adam may have messed up, but I've got another Adam who will come. His name is Jesus. And he will save his people from their sin. So we see this aspect of his character revealed in the incarnation. God takes the long view when it comes to the mission. He doesn't just sort of show up after a little bit of sin shows up in the world and says, all right, we're either going to scrap this or sort it out now. You. <laughs> he takes the long view. He doesn't rush it. He works his purposes. And he looks upon his people with patience. Even when we hold him at arm's length or turn our backs upon him. Colossians tells us, just hear it again. In him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, through Jesus, God was pleased to reconcile all things to himself. Does that sound like a grumpy God to you? Oh, those sinners. We talk like that sometimes. <laughs> Scripture tells us that Jesus came on a mission to rescue us because God is pleased to do it. His desire is to show up and redeem rebel sons and daughters. Sinners who have turned their back. He's pleased. We begin with Joseph's story to get a sense of what this salvation looks like also. God is not only patient but pleased to show up in Jesus and do the work of salvation. But Joseph's story has potential to expand our understanding of the work God wants to do in us and through us. Joseph is a righteous man. That probably means he kept Torah, and when he sinned, he did the things that the Old Testament said to do when you sinned to maintain your right status before God and in the community. He walks with God. He's a righteous man. He behaves like a righteous man. He's a good Christian. That's what we call it anyway, right? <laughs> but 
But God asks for more here, doesn't he? When we hear the word salvation, a lot of times we lean into what we call conversion, don't we? When someone saved says, I got saved at, or I got saved when, what do they mean? They mean the first time I felt the forgiveness of God was when I got saved, or the first time I felt God's peace in my life was my salvation, or something like that. And that's not wrong, but it's not all, is it? We kind of take that word saved and we link it with that one moment. But Joseph walks with God and it looks like there's more God wants to do in him, isn't there? He's a righteous man, but he's about to learn what it looks like to take up his cross. Because the task he was given to raise a son that wasn't his. is going to require some self-denial and some sacrifice. It's going to require some sanctification, I think is the theology word. <laughs> God is going to have to reproduce his character in Joseph, isn't he? He already walked with God, but he was now in a situation where, as Paul said, He's got to look to the interest of another instead of his own. And we begin to see that salvation isn't just forgiveness. It's transformation. To be saved from my sins isn't merely to be saved from the consequences of my sins. It is that at a minimum. It's also to be saved from their power today, tomorrow, and the next day. Joseph embodies that in this text. By laying down his vision of his best life. Here's what I expect, God. Here's what I expect from you, from her, Here's what I expect. And God's response is, here's what I'd like to do. I know that's not what you expect. <laughs> and Joseph has an opportunity to be a part of the mission of God, doesn't he? In this moment, he can either, like the mission's going to happen whether Joseph likes it or not, I think. <laughs> God's not going to call off the plan if Joseph doesn't respond well to the, to the angelic message, is he? Jesus is coming, ready or not. But Joseph has an opportunity to join the mission. He can either say, nope, it's too much. I can't handle it. You've asked for too much, God. And sometimes we want to say that, don't we? You might remember a time where you found yourself wanting to say to God, you've asked for too much this time. No one can give that. And I wonder if that's how he felt. <laughs> Before this angel shows up, you've asked for too much this time. He had an opportunity not only to receive God's saving work in him, but to become a participant in the mission of God to the nations of the world. I suspect he was glad he said yes. I suspect he was glad. Because in saying yes, Joseph is discovering, not only discovering, but beginning to participate in the missional heart of God. He became a father figure to the Messiah. Who would save us from our sins. The 
So if Joseph is a mature member of the people of God, but he doesn't know everything about the mission, and God wants him to grow into that, it leaves me asking, <laughs> Lord, what are you trying to open our eyes to? <laughs> what do you want us to see? And I think one of the things the Lord wants us to see as we hold the nativity alongside this poetry that we find in Colossians chapter 1, he's the image of the invisible God, firstborn among all creation. In him, all things were made. Through him, all things were made. For him, all things were made. And he's committed to the redemption of all things that are made. The picture we get in Colossians, is that the creator, the one who made it, came to save it. All of it. Nothing left out. That passion that would prompt the Son of God to lower himself, empty himself, and become to the point of death, even death on a cross, that passion, that character is the thing he desires to reproduce in his people. That's the missional heart of God. And it's the message of the nativity. It's the message of Christmas. This is what he offers us. And that means we have questions to answer. Now the questions that a church like Christ Church has to ask are different from some other churches. When you have been engaged in local and global mission partners, partnerships at a substantive level for 10, 15, maybe years, you're not asking the same set of questions as a church is trying to figure out who their first partner is going to be. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's a different set of questions, right? You got teams, you got people, you got partnerships. You have learned some things, you've done some things well, and chances, I'm guessing, you're probably thinking, we could learn something from that. <laughs> like anybody who does anything for 12 or 15 years has learned this has gone really well and this could have gone better. <laughs> now, sometimes people get worried when new preachers come in and start saying things like that. <laughs> but if we're driven by the God who has come to be with us, to enlist us in his commitment to bring the gospel to neighbors and all the nations of the world, if that's our highest love and our greatest priority, no question is off the table, is it? There are things we're committed to. We're committed to partnering with missionaries locally and globally, and that will never change. But after 12 or 13 years, we might have learned a thing or two about which partnerships are most fruitful and which are real partnerships and which maybe we call it partnerships, but it doesn't always feel like a partnership. I don't have anything specific in mind in case somebody's worried about their particular thing. <laughs> it's an important question to ask. I think it's a question that a lot of folks were asking before I got here. Here's the thing. It's always, 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 say it with me, always okay to ask, what have we learned? And when you do something for 10 or 12 or 13 years, it's probably a good time to ask, what have we learned? What has gone crazy better than we expected it to what's gone really well what's been remarkable like we did that and now it's grown up pam i think of eli 
in this. When this church got together to minister in the East Lake area, who envisioned what would be happening right now? And the work that would be done and the lives that would be transformed and the people that would show up. And who envisioned a ministry that has matured and grown up and been more fruitful, my guess is, than most folks probably imagined it would have been. That's beautiful and lovely. Let's do more. <laughs> but there's other questions. What can we do better? What have we learned? Are there places where we put people and energy and resources and maybe it's not as fruitful as we thought it would be? Or maybe a more targeted focus is going to help us out and get the gospel into places where it needs to be rather than breath. It's always, always, always okay to ask, what have we learned? This week, uh, Jane, Patrick, and I were looking through pictures for the website, and we saw some from the most recent Kenya trip, and I thought to myself, that, that's what we want more of. We're committed to supporting church plants around the world, and there are people worshiping together because of the partnership between living the faith and Christ Church. I love that. Let's do more. And maybe even we get more focused. The vision doesn't change. The vision doesn't change. Sometimes, missional strategies can develop and grow and get stronger so that the fruit we see in one place or down the street can be produced abundantly more so in other places where the Lord wants to work. And we can ask the questions because we know that the missional heart of God is our primary, primary, primary vision, commitment, end, goal, love, passion, all of the above. If God's character is being reproduced in us, those are the kinds of questions we're asking. Here's one development that might ha might we might be ready in a couple of years. Long before I ever got here, Christ Church was committed to church planting. Most of that has had to happen outside of the United States. One of the reasons is because if you're a United Methodist in the United States, and you want to plant a church in your city, <laughs> well, there's an entire bureaucracy that can get in the way of that <laughs> and make it very difficult to do. Well, guess what? Every bit of red tape is gone. It's not there anymore. It's all gone. How lovely would it be to see a cornerstone like the one in Kenya planted in Birmingham? How lovely would it be? The option wasn't there 18 months ago. It may very well be there in the next 18 months. What kind of church do we have to be for that to happen? We have to be a church that recognizes and is committed to more than anything else what we learn when Jesus shows up. That the heart of God 
is for the mission of his church. Everything else is aimed at that. If we're not persuaded that uh, nativity and mission belong together, I've only got one more, one more text, one more argument, one more, one more try. Most of us will be familiar with the Great Commission. Last thing Jesus says that's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Most of you could probably say it by heart. Go therefore, Jesus said, make disciples, all the nations, teach them to obey everything I commanded, baptize them. We get excited about that. We throw conferences around it. There's one more thing he says. You remember what it is? I will be with you. And if we're not reading chapter 1 in isolation from chapter 28... If we're not reading the nativity in isolation from the mission, we'll know that Matthew wants us to pay attention. Because the very words that ended his gospel were there at the beginning. His name shall be Emmanuel. Why? Because he is God with us. And by the time we get to the end of the story, We've seen the God who shows up. And now we hear Jesus say, I am with you. It's time to go out. Whenever New Testament author, Old Testament author, whenever any author drops words in like the same words in different spots, they're suggesting that we read those alongside each other. Jesus is God with us. And as the Gospel of Matthew develops, he wants us to discover that God with us is Jesus with us. And he is with us so that he can enable us to embody his missional heart. If that's not at the heart of our understanding of Christmas, if that's not the heart of the message of Christmas for us, if we get too busy or too tired or whatever, during December and lose sight of that, we have not yet begun to grapple with what this season means. The only question for us, same question Joseph had to answer, do you want to be a part of the mission of God?